Recently, I was listening to a talk on, um, that someone was giving, and they, they talked about um, man and the fact that God has created us in his image. And that, that, that uh, teaching was, I mean, even though I've always grown up with that understanding, that, that reading the Bible and hearing it taught, man being created in God's image and, and so forth, it's easy to, um, it's easy for me at least, to take it for granted, to say, yeah, that's fine, and, and go on, and not really understand all of the implications of what it means for man to be, have been created in the image of God. So children, I have a question for you. What is probably one of the single most important and foundational scriptures in the Bible? Can anyone answer? Anyone want to answer? Very good. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Without that basic understanding, we don't understand, we don't realize that God is the author of everything. He is the originator, the former, and because of that, he's also the authority. Children, what is the second most foundational scripture in the Bible? I'll give you a hint. It's up on the screen. <laughs> and it's what I'm talking about today. Verse 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. As I was saying, I heard a, 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 someone giving a, a message recently, and this was pointed out. And although I've, I've heard this passage throughout my life, the implications and the reality of it I guess never really sunk in. But the very fact that God would see fit to create man in his image is actually stunning when you think about it. He could have created us in our own image. He could have created us in the image of another animal. We could have been created in the image of a, a slug that, that slithers along the ground in slime. We could have been created in the image of a jellyfish that passively floats through the ocean. We could have been created in the image of a warthog, as, uh, as ugly and uh, disgusting as warthogs are. But no, God created man in his image. And if, if I talked about nothing else today, that is the single most important thing I want you guys to realize and to really think about. If we stop and think about that reality, he created us, he created man in his image. He has given us a tremendous honor that he would be a partaker, that he would allow us to be our partaker of his glory, that he would allow us to bear his image on the earth. That is absolutely stunning the more you think about it. Here's God, the creator of the universe, and he has made us in his image. And furthermore, it says, not only has he made us in his image, we're not just another animal, but we are unique in that we've been created in God's image. Then he placed us over everything on the earth. He gave us a special privilege and uh, authority on the earth that exceeds what the animal kingdom has. He gave us dominion over the fish in the sea and the fowl of the air, over the cattle, 
over all the earth and over every creeping thing upon the earth. So he says, so God says in verse 26, he's going to do this and then, he's, and then he does it. And so God created man in his image. And this is a unique verse here, verse 27. He created them, created man, male and female, created he them. So the image of God is not specific to the male gender. God manifests his image in both male and female, which is, in, which is tremendous when you think about it. It's difficult to, to grasp. We, all, we often think, oh, God's man, the image of God is male. No, it's male and female together reflect his image and his nature. And so when you think about that, that idea, man being created in God's image, well, why is it that we all look different? Why is it that we all have different talents and abilities? Why is it that not everybody is, is perfect? And it's because we are in his image, but we're not his exact image. We are a reflection, we are a, a vignette of, or a, a composite. So you can't, so you understand better who God is by looking at the entirety of the human race and not just a particular person. I think it's interesting, a lot of people say, well, I, why can't we see God? God's invisible. Well, first of all, God says he made us in his image. So when we look around at other humans, we are seeing a composite image of who God is, his nature and his person. That's phenomenal to think about. Now, I don't want to be getting off on theology here because it doesn't mean we end up worshiping ourselves. <laughs> we don't worship humans. That's why we're commanded not to have any graven image. It's a form of idolatry to worship anything but God. But it's phenomenal to think about how God did, he, he has given us a glimpse of who he is in the world around us, in the, in the human, in the human um, race that he has placed on this earth. So we can say, well, that's not true. God hasn't shown us himself. He has given us a glimpse of who he is. Furthermore, throughout the, the entirety of, of, of creation, there is the marvelous design, which is, a, um, which is evidence of God's creative power and authority. See, I wrote some notes here. I wanted to make sure I follow my notes. So people ask, why can't we see God? We, we see his image every day. God gives us a rough, a rough sketch of himself in the way he made us. This profoundly... This However, we must be careful we don't pervert this, this concept. While we are his image bearers, we do not worship his image. We worship him. This is why God commanded that we are not to create anything, any graven image. Even though we are created in his image, we are to worship him and not his image. Or anything we create in our image. Sinful man seeks to make God in our image instead of realizing that we are created in his image. So why is it that if we are created in the image of God, 
Why are we imperfect? Why are we, as the Bible says, children of wrath? Why are we sinners? Why do we see death in the world? Well, Genesis also talks about how man fell. Adam and Eve did not obey God. They rebelled against his created order. And as a result, we are in a, in a condition and in a state of being at war with God. We are in a, a default state of rebellion. Our hearts do not want to be subject to God. Ephesians 2.3 says, Among whom also we had our conversation in times past, and the lusts of, the, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So even though we bear God's image, and God has been uh, astonishing to condescend to us and give us, to allow us to be a partaker of his image, even though that's the case, our hearts are still in rebellion against God by, by default. We need to realize that the state of warfare between rebellious man and God is the default condition of all mankind. It's not just those people out there, not just the atheists or the pagans, the Muslims, the Buddhists, Democrats or Republicans. We are all born in the state of alienation from God with a heart that desires to throw off his authority and create our own God. Until you have bowed your knee before the king of the universe, the creator of all the earth, you are an enemy of God. You have a heart that wants to not just wander away, but that is either consciously or unconsciously in rebellion against God. I always um, thought it was remarkable when I was a kid listening to Becky Wyand. She always, uh, she's a godly teacher in our homeschool organization. And um, she would always talk about how she was a, a rebel at heart and that her nature is always seeking to rebel against authority. And I remember thinking, I would not think of her as a, as a rebel. But she had that, that understanding that she was openly and willingly admitting that she was a rebel at heart. And if we all were honest, we all have to realize that we too are that way. So it's because of sin and rebellion that the image of God, the image of a, of a, of a holy God is distorted as it is represented in man. So one of the things that I, uh, I often uh, find it easy to get frustrated or angry with other people when I, do, when I think that they're doing something uh, that I think is wrong or that is stupid or um, it just doesn't make any sense. And, and it's easy to get angry at other people and think, how could you be so dumb? How could you be so, how could you not see you're wrong there? And yet, when we understand and we see others as image bearers of a holy God, and that the image of God has been corrupted and distorted because of sin. We see that it's not the person we have to get angry at. We should be getting angry at. It shouldn't be. We should be seeing them as image bearers of God, and that as image bearers, they deserve the love and patience and respect because here they are bearing God's image. And if we are angry at them, if I am angry at that person because of their sin, <clears throat> then I'm ultimately angry at the, at the God who created that person. And I am 
letting sin distort God's image in, my, in myself. Because of sin, the image of God is distorted as it is represented in man. While we see the image of God made evident in man, it is a corrupted picture. Not only is man a corrupted or perverted picture of the image of God, but corrupted, rebellious, and sinful man that constantly seeks to overthrow God and redefine his order. Since the fall of man in the garden, there has been a continuous struggle, rage against God, against his authority, against his law, order, against his image. We see this raging played out every day in the world around us. When there is no God, man gets to decide what is right and what is wrong. Rebellious man wants to decide what is right not so much that he dislikes morality per se, but because he dislikes God. Man becomes the ultimate contrarian toward God. If God says it, man insists on the opposite. When God says, thou shalt not kill, man seeks to kill in mass. When God says to worship him, man worships everything but him. When God says to love our enemy, Man hates his neighbor. When God says, thou shalt not covet, man instead craves everything he does not have. When God says, thou shalt not commit adultery, man commits all forms of fornication. And I lost the rest of my notes there. And so we see the image of God attacked and rejected throughout the world. We see, it all, we see the evidence of it all around us in, in society, in law, in the recent, um, the recent effort to redefine marriage, in the, um, in the abortion industry. You think about abortion, that's such a, a tragic attack on the image of God. Here the very image of God is being destroyed and uh, ripped apart in the mother's womb. One way that man's, uh, one way that the image of God is distorted is that <clears throat> because God has created man in his image, Man is fundamentally different from the animal kingdom. But when the evolutionist says that man is just another animal, that is, that is an overt attack against the image of God. Because man is basically saying, here's the image of God, but it's actually equal to an animal. It reduces, it, it, it lowers God the image of God down to the level of an animal. That's also why we don't eat people. We don't eat men. If we are all just animals, then cannibalism is fine. But man is unique. And that's also why we do eat animals. We, God has given us since the flood, God has given man authority over the animal kingdom to eat animals for food. <clears throat> God's image is also expressed in both male and female, as I talked about earlier. Feminism seeks to throw off the feminine nature and position, and this distorts God's image. When feminism seeks to throw off the feminine nature or overthrow man's position, this distorts God's image. This is a corruption of God's image. 
Another di distortion of God's image is how we present or carry about in our, our physical bodies. We corrupt his image, whether it be through something like a tattoo or immodesty. That is a, a corruption of the image of God. So, why is murder wrong? We talked about killing animals. Why is it wrong to kill humans? And is there a difference between murder and killing? And there is. So can anyone tell me, children, why is murder wrong? Yes. Exactly. That in and of itself, that's a perfect, that's an excellent answer. That in and of itself is reason enough. But the reason is far more profound than just that. <clears throat> in, uh, and I think I didn't actually, get the verse. So after Noah gets off the ark, what does God tell Noah? Do you guys remember? Yes, Nathaniel. I'm sorry? Very good. You are right, buddy. That is exactly right. And I'll read you some, else, some of what else uh, God said to, to Noah. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now remember, what, that's what God also said to Adam in Genesis 1. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. Now this is different from before the flood. So now animals are afraid of man. God's put a, put a fear in animals. And upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, and upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. So not only is God giving the animals a greater fear, or a fear of man, but at the same time, God's giving them the ability, God's giving man the ability to kill of the animal kingdom. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I also, have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. So God's going to hold, God holds even animals responsible for killing humans. God's going to require human blood, the, spill, the loss of human blood at the, uh, uh, for, uh, hold an animal responsible for, for shedding man's blood. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, man, uh, made he man. So that is the fundamental reason why murder is wrong. It's because man has been created in God's image. Man is the image bearer of God. That is the fundamental reason. And that reason precedes the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are correct. You're absolutely right in saying that. But the foundational reason why the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not murder, is because in Genesis 9 and in Genesis 1, God created man in his image. We're the image bearers of a holy God. So that's why murder is wrong. Now is it true 
that killing is wrong. That killing anyone is wrong. There are some people that say, oh, the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not kill. No, it says, thou shalt not murder. And the reason why capital punishment should and must be enforced is because man is created in God's image. And it's, that is established here in this very passage. It says, I will require at the hand of every beast and at the hand of man and at the hand of every man's brother will I require the man's life. So God is going to hold anyone accountable for shedding man's blood. He's going to hold anyone accountable, any animal accountable for shedding man's blood. And it says, <clears throat> Whoso sheddeth man's blood shall by man his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And so man has been given the legal responsibility and obligation to enforce the death penalty on those who shed other man's blood. A couple uh, months ago I heard about this alligator attack in Florida. We all probably heard about it on the news. This alligator come up out of the swamp and, and grabbed this little two or three year old boy and killed the boy, sadly. And the authorities went on an alligator hunt. They tried to identify and locate every single alligator in that swamp. And they, um, they said, we think we found and destroyed the alligator that did this. And I think later on they, were, they said they were pretty sh uh, sure that they, they had killed the alligator. But when an animal, and this happens with, a bear, with bears or, or lions, when a bear mauls and kills someone, the first thing the park service does is it goes and kills the bear because what they say is so it does, this doesn't happen again. But ultimately it's because of this reason. Man's blood is sacred. Man's, man is sacred because we are created in God's image. So why is murder wrong? Who gets to make this determination? The world says it's because the majority has decided. And I've had this, this discussion with many people before. Um, I've asked, uh, on occasion, I've asked some, some uh, either atheists or uh, humanists in the past, so how do you determine what's right and wrong if you don't have the Ten Commandments or if you don't have God's Word to give you a framework? How can you say that murder is wrong? How can you say what is right and what is wrong if you don't have God's Word as your framework? <clears throat> the answer I've almost always gotten from the secularists, from a non-Christian, is that, oh, well, the majority decides. Because that's their really, really, that's their, their only basis. The group decides. Well, is that true? And is that a valid basis for right and wrong? I always like to um, point out what happened in Nazi Germany. The majority decided that it was okay to kill Jews. You look at our own society and <clears throat> we seem to be redetermining, and redefining what is right and wrong because of majority. And the question is, where is that going to stop? How, long, how, how far will you take that? You really, there's really no end to that. If the majority decides that 49% of the population needs to be exterminated, then they will. Now we know that that's wrong, but if the majority decides, then anything goes. There's really no basis that we have for right and wrong. I remember one discussion that I had with some, some guys and they were, we were making this exact discussion an argument, and I, so I asked them, I said, do you think that slavery was wrong? And they said, oh, yeah. Well, the majority decided. 
that in the South, they were the majority, they decided it was wrong. I mean, it was right, it was acceptable. So who are you to sit in judgment on their majority? How can you say it was wrong? And they, they didn't have an answer. The world says it's because the majority has decided or the group t determines it to be so. But once you remove God and reject God-made man, we are reduced to a subjective morality that is a slippery slope into the abyss. No longer can you say that murder is wrong if there is no God. If man is simply a, a bunch of molecules, then there's nothing wrong with snuffing out a bunch of molecules. No different than turning off an electrical circuit on a computer. <clears throat> if there is no God, then man has no competitor or master and can determine truth or right for himself. Once man reaches this point, anything goes because no one is in charge or so rebellious man wants to think. The Nazi Holocaust, abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, suicide, or any other taking of man's life is ultimately wrong because it is an attack on the image of God. And as I said earlier, murder is wrong not only because, it is, because God has said so, but more importantly because it attacks, mangles, and destroys his image bearers. Many of us, or some of us, have heard of this guy named Friedrich Nietzsche. He was a, uh, an atheist who I believe died in, uh, died in insanity. Um, he was one of the foremost thinkers of the, of the 19th century in uh, academic circles and in, in the secular world who, who has brought about much of the confusion and blindness that exists in our culture today. And Frederick Nietzsche is one of the famous statements that he made in, this, in his writing called The Madman. I think apt, apt, aptly uh, put, he says, God is dead, and we have killed him. And he's basically, this writing that he did is basically a form of a, a story where he talks about <clears throat> what society is like when God is, is killed. And that his point was that throwing off and killing, so to speak, God's authority in life and in society and in our world, we basically are reduced to nothing when it comes to having any framework or any basis for morality or truth. That there is, uh, we're basically, you're basically in a free fall. And um, interestingly, even though he claimed that there was no such thing as God, but by claiming such, he admitted, he was admitting that he was ultimately killing God's authority, killing God in society. And yet even he understood the implications of what that meant, that there was therefore no framework by which we had to live our lives, by which we had to determine what, what is right and wrong. <clears throat> so children, we have the truth, because God has given us his word, and we can rest in that truth. There's darkness when people seek to, to uh, shut out the truth, to redefine for themselves what the truth is, but God's word is what's true, and we can depend on that. We can rest in that, and that is what gives us 
light and life. When we have light, we can see where we're going. We have proper perspective. And we don't have to be afraid of the darkness that the world tries to create for itself. We don't have to be afraid of the darkness that we walk in by default, automatically, as sinners that God has come to, to redeem. And so, <clears throat> I want us to think about, to meditate on, and to realize the implications and the, what it really means that, that God has created man in his image. That we have been given a unique and amazing privilege that he has allowed us to be a partaker in his very nature in his div divine image and that we can bear his image on the earth and because his image is shrouded and distorted by sin that's what Jesus that's why Jesus came to cleanse us of that sin to redeem our lives to buy us back to redeem us back to God like to read um, Psalm 2. I always think about this psalm when I hear about the raging of rebellious man, whether it be gay marriage, whether it be any other distortion of law or authority or crazy idea that some university comes up with next or some world leader pushes whether it be Hitler's Holocaust or any other uh, or Islamic aggression or any other horrific uh, evil that we see Ultimately, in Psalm 2, this is all that's happening. Psalm 2 says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? That's all it is. It's raging. People are raging against God. Rebellious man who has not submitted their heart to the Lord is just raging against God. And they're imagining a vain thing. I like to ask my children, what does vain mean? You guys know what vain means? Can you tell me? I must not have uh, queried you guys on this in a while. Can anyone tell me what vain means? Right, empty. Vain is empty. The people imagine an empty thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Who is God's anointed, children? Right. Jesus is the, the Lord's anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Can anyone tell me what derision means? I believe it means utter confusion. Then shall, the, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. He'll speak to them in his wrath. He won't get all screaming and angry and so forth. He'll simply speak to them in his wrath and vex them 
in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Who's that? Jesus. I will declare the decree the Lord has, hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with the rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces as a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So my message, children, is that we have been created in the image of a holy and a righteous God. We have been given the privilege as humans, as men, as mankind, as having been created in his image, that we can bear his image on the earth, that we have been given a unique position of authority and a dominion over the animal kingdom and over the earth, the, the entire earth. And because we all bear his image, we all must respect and love and see others as his image bearers, regardless of how foolish they seem, regardless of how messed up they, their lives might be, regardless of how frustrated we may or get, become with them, it is because they bear the image of God that we must love them. We must respect them as his creation. And that gives us dra uh, drastically different, radically different perspective of others. Whether it's a, a radical Muslim or a, a radical homosexual or anyone else that seems radically different than we are. It doesn't mean we don't stand on the truth, but it means we love as God loved. So with that, I think I'll end there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that we would walk each day with reminder and with reality that we bear your image, that you have given us a unique and a, a special place in your world, that we can be your image bearers, that we have been made partakers of your image and of your nature. And that through the, the sanctification of the blood of Christ that washes us from our sins, that the image that has become marred and distorted by our sin, that that image can be made righteous and sanctified and that we, Lord, I pray that we would be glorifying of you on this earth as we bear your image and as we walk in the righteousness that you give. Help us to learn to love others as your image bearers, regardless of how lost they may be. They still bear your image, and so they are deserving of our love. Thank you for this truth, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.